This is Casey Groneveld. Our topic today is the wretched man. We're talking about the Apostle Paul, the last half of Romans 7. Paul calls himself a wretched man. Another title would be the dilemma of the new Christian. I went through this when I first accepted Christ, and I believe many of you did too. The only problem is we don't understand what happened when we accepted Christ. The problem is laid out by Paul in the last half of Romans 7. There's verses 15 and 18. Look at what Paul says and see if this fits. Paul says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, that I do. Sound familiar? He goes on. I know that nothing good lives in me, says Paul, that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. The key thing here is this term, sinful nature. Looking at Romans 7 again, only now verses 19, 21, and 24. Paul elaborates, For what I do is not the good I want to do. Now, says Paul, I know what I should do. But the problem is, the evil I do not want to do, says Paul, this I keep on doing. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, Evil is right there with me. So Paul is having a problem. And he lays it out. What a wretched man I am. Well, let's take a good look at this thing called wretched. This is Greek. Teleporos. A Greek word. There's Casey. There's Paul. There's you. Good example, he got a rope around his neck and he's pulling it himself. This shows a man in a terrible condition. Look at the translation of the Greek word. It can be wretched. Oh, what a wretched man I am. I got problems. It can mean distressed. I am so distressed. I'm frustrated with myself. And another one could be miserable. What a miserable person I am. And this is the way I felt when I first accepted Christ. Odd things were going on inside of me that I hadn't bumped into before. So we're going to have to look at this in much more detail to see what happened. Well, most new Christians go through this. I did Many of you did, and many of you are still going through it yet. And as you'll see later, this can affect more than just new Christians. Well, the question's simple. Why? Why do we go through this? Well, we're going to have to take a look at what Paul calls the old nature. This is something we inherited from Adam. It came down to all of us. So I tried to find an example of what would illustrate the old nature. Well, what I came up with was the old crow, cigar in his hand, little hat on, sly look. This is my example of the old nature. Now, in the Bible, this is also called sin or the sin nature. It's also called the carnal mind, the mind that dwells upon the sinful things. And it's also called the heart. We're going to have to look into this more thoroughly because this is a confusing word. The old nature, the heart. It's also called the old man. 
compared to the new man in Christ. It's also called the outward man, quite often what people see in us. It's also called the natural man. Seems to be the natural way many people are. And it is also called the flesh. So all of these now represent the old nature and this is what I use to illustrate what it looks like. Let's take a look at this thing called heart. Here's a definition. This is from Vine's New Expository Dictionary. Look what it says. Heart occupies the most important place in the human system. Well, we know that. There it sits, pumping the blood throughout our whole body. If the heart stops, I'll be dead. But look at the definition. By an easy transition, the word comes to stand for man's entire mental and moral activity. In other words, the heart, in the word of God, is used figuratively for the hidden springs of the personal life. Well, depravity is in the heart. Hey, that's what the Bible says. The Bible describes human depravity as in the heart because sin is a principle which has its seat in the center of man's inward life. Well, there's the heart. Look what the Bible says. It says the heart is full of deceit. We can go to Jeremiah, chapter 17, verse 9. Look what Jeremiah says. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Another one that pops up for the heart is the word unclean. Our nature is unclean. Again, here we look to Matthew chapter 15, verse 18. Matthew says, but the things that come out of the mouth, well, the Bible has a lot to say about the tongue, and the words coming out of our mouth, but the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart from this sinful nature inside of us. And these make a man unclean. Another example with the heart. The Bible also says the heart or the sin nature of man is evil. And again we go to Matthew chapter 15 verse 19. For out of the heart or this sinful nature comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. This list could go on and on and on. So the heart is the old nature. Now, let's take a look at what drives us, what motivates us. What drives us? Well, you can see my artistic ability here. I kind of drew a picture of our head. And I'm going to call this our control center. As though there's something in here that can steer us and guide us. So, we have a seat. The eyes are like the windshield. We have a, a wheel. Whoever sits there can steer us and guide us where we want to go. And also have the shift lever. We can go faster, slower. And we also have a brake. We also have the clutch pedals and a throttle and so forth. This is our control center. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Well, there's the old sin nature. We're born with it. Loves to sit in that chair and control us. We are born with this sin nature. Everybody who was born is born with this sin nature with one exception. 
Jesus Christ. The sin nature produces all kinds of sin and all sin comes from the sin nature. Well, we're starting to get a feel of Paul's problem here. A Dispensational Theology, an excellent book, everybody should have a copy by Charles Baker. Look what Baker says. Adam transmitted his fallen nature to all of his posterity. Well, that includes me and you. This explains why sin is universal. Men since Adam's day were born sinners, and they and we sin because we have a nature of sin. Well, the problem's getting clearer. Back to the control center and the old nature. Ever notice those who do not know Christ? They have no conflict. The old nature is there all by itself. We let the old nature run us, drive us, steer us, motivate us. There is no conflict when you don't know Christ. Ever notice? A lot of people who are not saved have a ball. They're living it up. They're having a good time. They're enjoying life. Well, 1 Corinthians 2.14 comes out with something very important. The man without the spirit, this is the unbeliever, the man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God. For Paul says they are foolishness to him. That's why the unsaved have no interest in the Bible, no interest in church activities, they are guided almost completely by the old nature. Now, when we accept Christ, something happens that changes this whole thing. The Holy Spirit places us in the body of Christ. We call this the baptism by the Holy Spirit, putting us into the body of Christ. And, look what it says, and the Holy Spirit moves in. We are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. Well, here's what I picked to represent the Holy Spirit. Here's the dove. Now, 1 Corinthians 3.16, back to Paul. Beautiful verse. Don't you know, says Paul? that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now think about that a minute. Wherever I go and whatever I do, I carry the Spirit of God with me. The Holy Spirit moves in. Here comes the problem. It's a big problem. I noticed this right away when I accepted Christ. Something changed inside of me. And all of a sudden there were things I could not understand about myself. And I was in the same situation that Paul is. The very same problem. Well, back to our control center. There's the old nature. He's still there. He wants to sit in the driver's seat. But also, the Holy Spirit is now there too. This is what causes the problem. Now, there is conflict because they don't get along with each other. How do we know that? Galatians 5.17, look what Paul says. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, 
and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. This says, ah, go ahead and do it. This one says, no, you should not do that. This is what Paul's talking about. Paul went through the very same thing in the last half of Romans 7. Well, the problem, there it is. Quite often, we put the spirit in a little cage in the back and let the old nature run our lives. Romans 7.16, remember where Paul says, I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do I do not do, but what I hate to do. In other words, the Spirit of God directs us into what we should do. But the old nature says, no, no, you don't want to do that. So that is the basic problem that we have. We allow the old nature to control us. We allow the old nature to sit in the driver's seat. And we shove the Holy Spirit in the back, lock him up in a little cage. Well, this can cause problems too because people look at us all the time, especially once they know we have accepted Christ. They look at us on Sunday. Well, Sunday, we often let the Holy Spirit sit in the driver's seat. We go to church, put money in the plate, we listen to a nice sermon, we may even yell out hallelujah or amen once in a while, and wonderful time. But then comes Monday. Oh, hey, now this is work. We have to wheel and deal and connive a little and so forth. Uh, Holy Spirit, you better go sit in the back because I'm going to let the old nature control me. So people see us Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and so forth, controlled by the old nature, not by the Holy Spirit. And out comes that word, hypocrite. Oh, they're so nice on Sunday. But the rest of the week I see something entirely different. Well, here we go. The Holy Spirit, the old nature. What's the solution to this problem? We have to find this out. Well, the answer comes from the Apostle Paul. Paul gives us the answer. I like Paul. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. I'm a Gentile. I look to Paul for the answer. Now, the old nature cannot please God. This is a fact. The old nature cannot please God. Look at Romans 8, verse 8. What does it say? Those controlled, says Paul, by the sinful nature cannot please God. And we want to please God. Well, let's take a look at what's called the Spirit-controlled life. There's the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. Beautiful verse. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If you let the Spirit sit in the driver's seat, <laughs> the problem will be pretty much resolved. Romans 8.14 Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. The Spirit is put into us to lead us, guide us, and direct us. The Spirit-controlled life. Again, Romans 8, verses 1 and 2. Are you beginning to notice we're hitting Romans 8 pretty hard? Well, there's a reason for that. But here's the first two verses. Therefore, says Paul, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free. We can be free 
of the old nature as long as the spirit is in control. Well, Paul presents the problem in Romans chapter 7, that last half of that chapter. But Paul gives us a solution in Romans chapter 8. Now here's an interesting thing about these chapters in Romans. Taking the term the Holy Spirit. Do you realize in Romans chapter 1 through 7, all of those seven chapters, the term Holy Spirit is only used one time. But we turn to Romans chapter 8, and the Holy Spirit is used 19 times. This is why many call it the Holy Spirit chapter. So Paul is saying the solution to his problem in the last half of Romans 7 can be found in Romans chapter 8. And the answer is the Holy Spirit. What we need to do is lock up the old nature in the back and let the Holy Spirit sit in the driver's seat to control and direct us. This is what must be done by the Christian. Because remember I said, we are the one who determines which of the two will sit in the driver's seat. Take a look at Galatians 5.25. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step, says Paul, with the Spirit. In other words, we must walk with the Spirit, hand in hand. And let the Spirit guide us and control us and direct us as we go through life. Another beautiful verse, Galatians 5.16. So I say, says Paul, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. So by letting the Spirit be in control and locking up the old nature, we will be in step with the Spirit of God. Well, who has this problem? Well, we talked so far about pretty much the new Christians. Remember, before you accept Christ, there's no conflict. You accept Christ, the Spirit moves in, they don't get along. The new Christians have this problem. But also, it's a problem with what we call babes in Christ. These are people who have accepted Christ, but many of them have been sitting in the pew for 15, 20, 25 years, and they're still babes in Christ. In other words, their life is primarily controlled by the old nature, not the Holy Spirit. And a third group we call the backsliders. Those who at one time were on fire for the Lord. The Holy Spirit was in control. Then little by little the old nature worked its way back into the driver's seat. We call them backsliders. They literally have yielded themselves to the old nature. Well, a fascinating thing happened at the cross. When Christ was on the cross... Matthew 27, verse 46 says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What that is literally saying, somehow God turned his back on Christ. Well, I believe when these words were spoken by Christ on the cross, I believe here is the time when Christ absorbed like a sponge my sin and your sin. He took upon him our sins and God literally had to turn his back on that sin until the blood was shed to pay the price. Well, why is this so important? Why are we spending so much time on these things? Well, look at this. The Holy Spirit 
desires a ministry through the Christian. This is the goal. The Holy Spirit moves in. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit wants to use us to reach others. The Holy Spirit needs us. He needs a mouth. He needs legs to walk with, to get around. So he uses us to contact others. We call this walking in the Spirit. When the Spirit is in control, he can use us for the ministry. Well, suppose the believer has a lot of sin in their life. Well, things now turn around a little bit. Now the arrows move inward toward the person. The spirit is grieved when sin is present. In other words, when the old nature is allowed to take over the Christian's life, the Holy Spirit is grieved. But when sin is present, the spirit must turn to a ministry to the person, not through the person. See the difference? Well, let's take a look at this term, babes in Christ. Oh, hey, some churches are full of them. Paul says babes in Christ must be developed into mature Christians. Because the Holy Spirit can only use a mature Christian. Well, let's look at how this can turn into a problem. If most of the people remain babes in Christ, here's Sunday school. Guess what? We're going to have teachers who are babes in Christ. Many of them are not qualified to teach Sunday school. Want me to make this worse? How about this? Quite often, the babes in Christ get on the church board. Well, you can have a lot of problems with that. Here's a lot of the infighting. Here were churches sometimes split into two groups. We need mature Christians on our church board in teaching Sunday school. But, sometimes you have to take what you got, and that can present a problem. Well, the question now is, how do we come mature? The babe in Christ must become mature in Christ. Well, 1 Corinthians 3.1 Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, Paul's talking to the Corinthians, but as worldly, mere Infants in Christ. Well, take a look at this guy. He looks like he's probably about 25 years old. Lunchtime comes, he opens up his briefcase, takes out his bottle with a nipple on, and starts drinking his milk. You would sit back and say, what's going on here? Something is wrong here. Goodness, a grown person should be eating solid food, not drinking milk anymore. But this is what happens when a person remains a babe in Christ. <laughs> That's all they can take. So they don't grow, they don't mature. 1 Corinthians 3, 2, what does Paul say? I gave you milk, meaning the simple things in the word. Because, says Paul, I could not give you solid food. For you were not ready for it. So the maturity and the growth comes in the study of the Word of God. That's why I like to see Sunday night services where people can grow in the Word. I like to see people attending Sunday school. I like to see people going to church on Wednesday nights. These are the places where we can get solid food and help these people to mature and grow and learn how to rightly divide the Word of God. Well, Ephesians 4.11, but 
Paul gives us more of the solution. He says, it was he who gave some to be apostles and some to be prophets. Well, we don't have them anymore. We don't need them. We have the whole, total, complete word of God. But he goes on, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, and teachers. They're given to us. We call them the professional ministry. We pay them. They're the ones who sit on the platform. Quite often we say, hey, they're the professionals. They are the ones who have to win people to Christ. They are the ones who have to motivate. They are the ones who have to bring in the new people. Well, there's a why. Ephesians 4.12, it goes on. We are given the evangelists, teachers, and preachers to prepare who? God's people. Well, who are they? <laughs> They're the people sitting in the congregation. You are saved and given the Holy Spirit to do the works of service. Now, if the Holy Spirit can only use those who are mature in Christ, then it is very important that the evangelists, the preachers, and the teachers prepare and mature God's people so they can do works of service. Why? It goes on, so that the body of Christ may be built up. It has to be built up in two ways. One way, babes in Christ to be developed into mature Christians. Secondly, we must help lead people to Christ because I believe when the last person comes into the body of Christ and it is complete, then I believe the rapture will occur. Well, we've covered quite a bit. We've heard about Paul's problem and we now understand Paul's solution. And here we are walking through our life as a Christian. We got problems, we got conflict. Remember what the solution is? Well, says Paul, walk in the Spirit. In other words, let the Holy Spirit sit in the control seat and guide us and direct us where the Spirit would like us to go.